Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today, I'm speaking with a therapist for my mental well being and yours, learning about the importance of compassion with the founder of the Center for Compassion Focused Therapy. Please welcome Dennis Turch. How has the lockdown been for you? I mean, you've, have you have got a boost in patience, I bet. Well, yeah, a lot of people came in. Working from home was nice, too, because we have a daughter who's very young, a two-year-old daughter. And a lot of the things that I think matter to my partner, Laura, and, and myself, we can kind of do from here and do locally. So being able to just work from our home office was really sort of special, even though, you know, appreciating the, the suffering and the struggle that everyone was going through and then the losses. It's, it's a very profound and strange time. It is, isn't it? It's really just a huge social experiment. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we really fully appreciate yet. I mean, some people might, but I think in general, it's going to take a while to understand like the kind of traumatic, a traumatic response that we're having and, and the range of you know, sort of psychological impacts, health impacts on, on most people that, that we're enduring. It's also struggling to know what to think, you know, what opinion to have. Have you found that problem? Because I also interviewed uh, Martin Kuldorf, who's, who's an epidemiologist, and he says the lockdowns were, were having a very negative effect on people's mental well-being. And then you get other people saying it was very necessary if we'd rock, lock down hard, maybe the virus wouldn't have spread. And I mean, I get confused. What, what's your take on all of this? I think the perspective that our context affords us is really hard to argue with. And what I mean is that the early days of the lockdown in New York City and in the county that I'm in, which is Rockland County in the Hudson Valley outside of New York, early days of the lockdown here, there were so many, so many people who were ill and there were so many deaths, even with the lockdown. You know, there were, I was having sessions and the clients, you'd hear ambulances behind them, you'd hear ambulances behind me. Several people I know who were older died, one younger person died, and and people were reporting looking out of their, you know, apartment window and seeing freezer trucks for the abundance of people who died. So the beginning was so horrible and acute. Mm. We we were one of those places where that happened, that the the gravity, you know, the gravity of the situation was really clear. It became, you know, luckily with the, with one exception of someone in their nineties, there was there's nobody who was like really in our inner inner circle who passed away thankfully but it was enough to just spend so many hours every week w w w talking about this extremely stressful situation and literally hearing it and seeing it all around so it changed everything so that kind of like i guess kind of like sealed in uh, my confidence in how necessary this was even and then subsequently looking at the data and the research. But like, yeah, I guess then there's another type of trauma. People were just so fearful. And then I guess it plays into something else. Oh yeah. There's a, the, the computer programmers are fond of the old saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, like everything has a cost, everything has a side effect and the huge costs to yeah. the lockdown, huge cost of social isolation, mental, emotional, sometimes physical health costs. It's we haven't even begun to appreciate how costly this has been. And also because everyone's had, like, if it was a war, it's so much clearer, isn't it? There's the, there's the enemy there and then people having this trauma, but everyone's having, you know, in all these different situations, some people are in the countryside, some people are in big cities, there's all these, everyone's having a different kind of experience. So it's a very confusing time, no? I agree. I think it's a really important observation. And it's inherently invalidating for a lot of people, you know, like it's just one of my mentors in a, like a group meeting had said, we're, we're having a good war. Is it also an English person who said, we have, you know, mm -hmm. we've, we've had a good war. This is, reminds me of like the war, you know, my parents and things and what it means to have a good war. Like 
and you know, speaking to a number of intellectual introverted musicians and philosophers and psychologists on this call, you know, and it was very true. And just recently, you know, the pandemic restrictions have, have much more rapidly than I anticipated dropped in this region. So quite suddenly, in fact, there's a lot of people, a huge number of vaccinated and there's a lot of people out and about. So we took a couple of weeks off and we were out and about, you know, the family and everything. And it wasn't until then, I think that I had realized how much it had actually affected me, how much of like physical exhaustion, stress and social isolation, because I was so embracing this concept of this is a good war. I'm writing more music, you know, practicing more meditation and with my baby daughter and my wife and here in the country. Wow, this is great. And all of a sudden it was like, holy crow, this is actually, this has been an exhausting and stressful <laughs> ordeal <laughs> simultaneously. I guess, yeah, when you go outside and you have to, to do all the socializing again and adapting again. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the re a colleague of ours at the Center for Compassion Focused Therapy, uh, Dr. Talia Vogel, who's an early career psychologist, excellent work she does. She was emphasizing to our group how, you know, often it's after a traumatic experience or after like a high intensity stress experience that people will feel it in the body. They'll kind of realize, you know, once we're in some place of relative safety. We can, you know, slow down and then we have the experience of the sequelae mm. of the trauma. And I think that's happening to millions of people right now. As soon as it, it's not just celebratory freedom from lockdown and pandemic restrictions and pandemic threat, it's very heavy. They realize what's happening in their bodies and in their emotional lives, quite something. But this, what makes you do so important? It's so important then because compassion, it, it applies to people. If people are angry about the lockdowns, if they're, if they're really suffering because of the loss because of the virus or any kind of even trauma, then compassion, it does play into all of this no? Oh yeah. The, the mode of being that compassion can be understood to be like this embodied motive of giving and receiving care sensitivity to the presence of suffering and a willingness to take action. That's more than an idea or a value or a concept. That's an embodied uh, way of operating that changes our functioning on every level from immune system functioning to heart rate variability to our emotional lives. And from that stand, that approach, being able to access our compassion compassion mode or compassionate mm. mind and, and inhabit that, proceed from that is a huge, uh, huge help at times like this. So I guess it's a stupid question, but what is compassion and what, how do we, in your, are there different definitions or is it an experience or a mental state or an action? Yeah, yeah. there, there's different definitions, a very popular definition of self-compassion. I'm sure you're familiar with from Kristen Neff and which is that self-compassion involves mindfulness and a sense of common humanity and self-kindness. It's an apt definition for self-compassion and it's you know useful in its way. And she does great work, love her approach. The, and there's several other you know, nuanced definitions from the Stanford group or from Emory University and things like that. The definition that I find most resonates with me and my clients uh, and students is the definition that Paul Gilbert adopted and sort of adapted from the Dalai Lama and just a historical definition of compassion, which is that com compassion is a sensitivity to the presence of suffering in self and others, blended with a willingness and a commitment to take action, to alleviate and prevent that suffering. And, you know, we view that in the CFT world and in some branches of compassion science, we view this as an expression of the human caregiver behavior repertoires and the, the, the attendant neurophysiological uh, structures and functions of what it is to be an awake, aware, caregiving, care receive human being. And when we're in that mode, it's a very different mode, very different kind of deployment of attention, different behaviors that are available. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know what you mean. It's a, a feeling of, is it love? Ooh, that's a big one. You know, I'm a little bit more pro using the word love than some of my colleagues because I, I 
have a sort of a grounding in love as it's defined in in Buddhism and in Vedanta and the, as as an as an unconditional experience of interbeing and interconnectedness and a devotional love where there's just such a flowing almost adoration of all being and all living things so we're 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 recognizing the sacredness that exists among us and between us and within us and allowing this affective experience of flowing love which is certainly related to compassion paul gilbert and other colleagues make the distinction between love and compassion because if you think of love as preferential or like who you like who you don't like is love in the western sense is being more akin to like and dislike mm. that's wrong though isn't it? it should be it should be selfless love real love is yeah. Love is a butchered word in the West. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you. Yeah. So I think that mode of love is closer to compassion, but we make a lot of distinctions between, because you can be compassionate to people you don't love. You can be compassionate to parts of yourself you don't love, et cetera. Okay. Okay. So, so then how do we, how do we cultivate that? I guess that's the important logical question. How do we cultivate it? Well, it's a little bit like, it's a lot like music. You know, it's a lot like practice, you know, how do you okay. get the muscle memory and how do you get the intention and how do you develop the kind of mindset? And there are specific techniques and, and ways within uh, psychotherapy or training to cultivate compassion as, a, as, as that mode of being. Much, it's, for me, it's very similar to working with music. So when I, when I get depressed, Sometimes I always, it's hard. It's usually for a selfish reason, you know, it's usually that I, there's something wrong with me, you know, so if, but if I pick up the telephone and remember to call someone who I know is in a worse situation than me, it puts everything into perspective, you know, mm. sort of takes the focus off of our self-evaluations and our preoccupations with whether we're good or whether we're bad or whether we failed or succeeded. And we're just focusing on another yeah because i can I mean i can if i turn on the news and watch all the depressing news about all the terrible things going on in the world and try to feel compassion that it doesn't i don't you know and then i turn the news off i'm not depressed afterwards you know what i mean but i'm mm. depressed from i'm depressed from my problems which are so petty compared to the the big issues yeah i think that that's a really valuable perspective i find something similar there's a shift in perspective and in a sh and again a shift in the mode so if we're if we're in a mode that emphasizes either social threat or drive it's, you know this is all from compassion focused therapy but it's also in the, the original teachings of the buddha like when we're preoccupied with wanting to have the things we can have or we're preoccupied with wanting to get rid of the things we were stuck with yeah then we suffer, you know, we suffer because we see there's something wrong with being just as it is, you know, and the act of caring and connection and inclusion and involvement with the world just as it is can be very healing. Mm. There's a lot of wisdom in that, that what you described, Jack. It's that craving and aversion, isn't it, that the, the Buddha talks about. Mm. Mm -hmm. I did, I did a few of those 10 day Vipassana retreats, one of the Goenka ones. Yeah. You get those hour long lectures every night and they really help, you know, that, that was my first introduction to, to Buddhism really. And you found it helpful, useful. Have you done one? I haven't done those specific things, but I've spent a fair amount of time on different retreats in the Zen tradition or in the Gurdjieff work and other types of Tendai Buddhism, things like that. Cause you were before you, psychology, you were a Buddhist before psychologist no? Yeah, yeah. I started with a real passionate interest in Buddhism and, you know, all different states of consciousness and specifically working in Vajrayana Buddhism and Tendai and things like that. That's great. So you have a real grounding in it. I actually heard you telling a story about your uncle who trained you. You said you wanted to be a Jedi. So he <laughs> trained you. He gave you know, stare at a dot on the wall for an hour or yeah. things like stare at a candle, maybe things like that. Develop your mind power. That's a great way to, to teach, inspire a kid, no, to these practices. Being my, uh, you know, practices mindfulness is kind of boring, no? It's beautiful that you remembered that. Yeah, you know, I was like 10 years old and this sort of nerdy 
kid and kind of anxious and somewhat isolated. And this wonderful member of the family, wonderful uh, uncle who had been marrying my aunt and had been a paratrooper in World War II and a Zen practitioner. And he said, oh, you know, the Jedi, they, they have these powers. You can have them too. And just like stare at that wall. And I remember setting up this sort of like little makeshift Jedi shrine thing and and just beginning to sit. And then your mind goes, you know, like you have these experiences and 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 they can be profound even when you're very young. And it, it, it leads to curiosity and questioning. And it's a great resource to help us. Have you seen in the new Star Wars movies that they're kind of developing? They're developing more because the yogis were Jedis. No, they could, you, the, in the Vedas, you know, they can go invisible and, and levitate. And, and I think in the latest Star Wars movie, he projected himself for a battle and he had a battle and then he was not actually there. It was just, he just projected himself. And another time they did spiritual healing. So I think as these things come into the back in, back into the mainstream, then the kind of the media reflects them and also, you know, movies like, you know, the matrix and things like that. It's, oh yeah. There, I mean, the, the, these is kind of archetypal depictions of, you know, the strength and power of like compassion and wisdom and transcendence and what, what, what we're capable of when we really understand our inner nature, you know, CDs as they talk about them. And I was just, you know, I think we get a connection here because I was just about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's it. Those are such, you know, there's sort of slight, a lot of the stuff was really off limits to discuss in psychotherapy mainstream for like a really long time. And it seems that in the last several years, I think partially driven by people being wary of cultural appropriation, right? And like the idea that taking only an emphasis on completely secularized, researched, Western, you know, white upper middle class kind of academic viewpoints on mindfulness, acceptance, compassion, transcendence, like that's not really too wise. It's certainly not politically okay anymore. And that I think has opened up people to look at the actual source material and it's pretty vast and expansive. Cause you've gone through the gamut. You, when you started meditation was kind of a dirty word. You maybe get laughed at for sitting down there and people were a bit silly, but do you, and you've gone through that. Do you think there will come a time when people talk about the cities and, and things like that and how these, I mean, you see monks levitating in, in, on YouTube and things like that. Do you, do you see a time for that as well? I think we now are just beginning to approach things beyond mindfulness even a little. I think beginning to talk about transpersonal and ego dissolving states and states of awakening is the next like logical step. And that's sort of happened, you know, Sam Harris's book and his whole thing with waking up, which is important. And the research around psychedelics in well-being is really encouraging a lot of people to take seriously what it means to have a self-transcending experience. When it comes to, I kind of think that cities are sort of like the, the, the sugar in the medicine, you know, the appeal of like, maybe I could have some kind of a power. <laughs> and I think that that, Jedi. yeah, yeah, that gets exactly gets people, it can get people excited. And in like the Zen tradition or the Gurdjieff tradition, or a lot of the things I was involved with, the attitude is like, oh, you just had a really powerful experience. That's really good. Like, you know, come help mop sweep, the floor. Sweep the floor, yeah. <laughs> sweep the floor, exactly. Like, let's, let's come back to the real world. Mm. And and that at first can be like a buzzkill and a, like a letdown. But then after a while, it's actually an invitation to bring the sublime into the everyday, like to take the, like those transcendental moments and, and have them and suffuse your everyday, most banal experiences with them. And also to appreciate that if everything, like Hua Yen philosophy talks about this really beautifully, like these different stations and layers of being, so that if if everything is interconnected, if everything is one, then, you know, feeding the dog and hearing the, the dog food hit the bowl is as special an experience as like falling in love or astral projection or something. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I remember an autobiography of a yogi, he had to 
he had to sweep the floor after experiencing cosmic consciousness. And yeah, I mean, do you think like telepathy could be the next thing that's like kind of on the horizon then for this interconnectedness? And because there's been many experiments that have proven that. You know, I tend to hold all of those things really lightly and not just as a hedge, you know, not just like, oh, I don't want to say anything too far out, you know, you know, because scientific bona fides, I want to, I don't want to imperil that. Like, <laughs> I don't care, you know, too much about that. But what I found is like, and this is something I never really talk about publicly, but like when I did have more profound, like awakening experiences or even experiences where they were hard to explain, mm-hmm. you know, and I was a younger person where people wanted me to, you know, talk about their future or like, that it felt like a deep connection or some, some of these like, you know, difficult to square with reality kind of experiences we can have on a spiritual path. I sort of made a decision that I don't need to believe them or not believe them. Sort of like the aontological perspective we hold in ACT that Steve talks about. Like, I don't really know what ultimately is really happening and how much of this is real or unreal. And I don't, I don't need to like try to create a clockwork model of the exterior universe and, and try to guess how much is real. I just need to be able to put one foot in front of the other and live in the world, which is one of the reasons why I opted to go to graduate school in psychology. Because, you know, studying more esoteric Buddhism and, you know, you start to retreat from everyday society and you start to like, you either are exclusively operating in a spiritual realm or you're like, you go to a hospital (laughs) where they keep you, (laughs) you know, like, (laughs) uh, because, you know, so part of the differential diagnosis of psychosis, right, is like whether or not you're willing to entertain doubt about the experiences you have. So I I think doubt's really healthy. So like, I would be very interested in understanding what is going on when people report telepathy, telepathic connection, empathy, contact at a distance. I'd be very interested in seeing how science accounts for that and seeing if there's ways that that can be cultivated because so many people report having those experiences, right? But I'm perfectly comfortable with not knowing how real anything mm. is let alone telepathy i guess with your work i don't i know i'm just jumping to his conclusions here but you know you worked with homeless people before and then you you wanted to get into psychology to help people so i guess you're kind of getting people on the first rung no i mean people struggling in this in the in the mud and you just want to help yeah. them get over there themselves basically can i say that totally i mean you, you you're so you're so skilled at understanding the person you're interviewing and really showing up for the interview. I really value that. It's Thanks. excellent. You know, Thanks. here and now, strangely enough, the people I work with now, they, they cover such a, such a wild range, you know, like I've, some folks who I consult with who are, you know, uh, multi-billion dollar businesses that they're in charge of. Right. So we're like mm. consulting around psychological flexibility as a has applied to trading strategies and all these things. And then there's other folks I work with who are severely and persistently mentally ill and economically disadvantaged. And then everywhere in between right now, like, so if I see 40 people in a week or 30 people, there's such an interesting range. And I really value that. I feel really lucky. Really, it's a gift to be able to work with the the, the huge spectrum of human challenges. Mm. So you work with billionaires as well and i've always wondered if i was thinking about empathy if that if have if accumulating all this wealth is is a lack of empathy and in, in, in essence compassion because if you take all the twinkies and you see people on the street without any twinkies how do you feel about that you know i think it can be for some individuals and then for other individuals there's a momentum of their cause and effect or their karma like what they studied at school being in the right place at the right time or wrong place, depending on your, you know, politics or view, and then being involved with business and industry and making investment decisions that generate wealth and create positivity and have a momentum. And that is a very rare thing for people to walk away from. You mean so, the hit the hit down and the you know, push you and, forward. And, and they're often people who are, you know, people, the people that I work with who are 
you know, I'm, I'm also, I have a biased sample, right? So if I'm working with someone, they want to work doing compassion and psychological flexibility and mindfulness work. So I'm usually meeting uh, people. So they know they have a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They want to work with ethics and they also want to maximize their performance. And my position on this is that psychological flexibility, mindfulness, compassion for others and self-compassion all contribute to better performance in what you do. Right. And they also can contribute to ethical action. And that's exciting to me, you know, watching individuals, whether it's in the course of their own, you know, apartment or their relationship or their drug and alcohol recovery, or whether the decisions they make about like a manufacturing concern and like we can save 10,000 jobs or not, or we can short sell stocks that, you know, cause market disruption, or we can invest that in things that generate pro-social action, like seeing that. It's fascinating. It's just beautiful, actually, oh, on all levels. Great. Yeah, because if you're working with somebody who's in charge of a company, you know, if you're working with some, I know, I'm going to say housewife but, or house mom, house husband. Yeah, sure. House, then sure. They, they, they can affect the family and that's great. But if, you know, if you're in charge of a big company and you have an awakening at that position, that later in the week, I'm speaking with Judy Wicks, who wrote uh, Good Morning, Beautiful Business. Have you read that book? I haven't read it, but I've, I've heard of it and heard of her work. Yeah. So she's just what you, when you were saying about somebody who developed a conscience, I think she had a conscience before she started, but anyway, you know, she might think she made a decision to pay everyone in the company a, a percentage of hers or like not, no one, no one should earn less than, I'm going to kind of correct myself later, but no less than a third of her salary or something like that. So that it, that when she grew, when the profits went, everyone got up and so then she got all the best people in the company in the area to come and work for her because you know if you're a belt bus boy or a waiter you're earning mo much more in her restaurant so everyone you kept growing and growing and logically so you know if jeff bezos had this philosophy imagine yeah i think we're at a point where more sane models of distribution of resources are called for, right? Like just like more collectivity, more decentralization. I get very excited about some models that are related to blockchain technology, but more importantly, like that are based around networks of value and how that value can be understood and distributed so that it isn't essentially held. You know, it's, it's, it's I really look forward to seeing how that develops. Yeah, because we're on this rush to globalization and you've seen where things like COVID the virus is spreading so fast because of globalization. And yeah, if we were all local, it'd be so much more support networks. Wouldn't we be, I think we've, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Yeah. Local and, 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 and yet also interconnected. So like right now we get a lot of the costs of globalized networks, but not so many of the benefits, some of the benefits, like we're having this conversation now, you know, like across the vast uh, space oh. and time. I'm a you fan know, of this, this part. Don't get me wrong. It's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Sure. sure. It's this, I, I think the central to compassion focused therapy and the Dharma and act and all the things that I get really excited about are, is this different conceptualization of what it is to be like a person and to recognize our place in the flow of life, to recognize how much that causes us suffering that we didn't choose and that we have to deal with to kind of get out of individual fault and shame and blame and just a recognition of uh, our interconnectedness. And our bodies respond to that. You know, our bodies respond to that and we function better as at the, at the level of cells, like a cell that's only focused on itself and not the collective is a cancer cell, mm -hmm. you know? And an individual that's not focused on what it can contribute, what he or she can, or they can contribute is, you know, is practically a sociopath or, you know, someone who's shutting down and affecting those around. And like, so these are scalable principles from evolution. And it's just like the wisdom of, of, of life, like the living wisdom of, of being. And once we can tap into that, everything can drastically improve, you know, non-violence, non-cruelty, moving out of like threat and aggression and the illusion, our addiction to the illusion of separateness. I think this idea that, that compassion is possible 
like training the mind and compassion as possible and it, tra it transforms your life, but that it's possible. People have a real hard time. Like our two year old, I'm mentioning my daughter a lot because I love her and she's always on my mind. You know, she's like the expression of the universe right now that's teaching me, my little guru. And she, she went up to a kid on the playground and said like, just talking to him, it's very rich. It's like a pandemic kid. So she hadn't had that experience and she, they were talking. She was like, come to the swings, come to the swings. And the little boy was like, oh, I don't want to. And she said, kid, it's possible. It's possible. And the little kid went, it's possible. And they both just were looking at each other going, smiling, going, it's possible. It's possible. They didn't actually go to the swings, but they were just grooving on that idea. You know, these two, two, two little two-year-olds being like, ah, possible, you know? So I guess that's part of what we're talking about, that this is like, things are, and, and Robert Fripp, a mentor of mine, likes to say like, we begin with the impossible and we move gradually towards the, the that we begin with, the, we begin with the possible, and we move gradually towards the impossible. So that's cool. Yeah, cool. Well, you know, that's 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 beautiful. <laughs> Did she hear that from from you speaking, saying that? Well, I guess you know, she has two two compassion focused therapy per people as her parents, two two shrinks as her parents, and so she picks up things like it's possible, or. She said, like, love is the answer the other day, which was really nice, you know, and she also does every other regular kid thing, like, you know, have a tantrum or want to watch Muppet Babies. And she, <laughs> she says, like, maybe a lot, like, like, this is the most therapist-like thing. She'll say, how about, or maybe before any suggestion, she'll be like, maybe chocolate or like, how about we go to the playground? <laughs> Funny stuff. All new to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's new. You realize the effect you have on children is inevitable, no? Oh yeah, it's wild. It's a lot of pressure it, on. It does. It does for every little, you know, tense moment or, I think it's a good reminder, you know, it's like a, you know, it's kind of like a, keeps you, keeps you honest. Yeah. So I just need really the verse to the song, just maybe some compassion techniques, you know, some little nuggets people can take away so that they get something from the song. I always like to do that. Oh, you know, I mean, I think part of what we do with imagery work is we look to like stimulate the brain and body in a way that allows us to practice being the version of ourselves we wish to be, you know, and Paul Gilbert makes the point that if you, if you imagine something like a sexual fantasy, it's example, he likes to use. I, I'm always anxious in America. I don't want to say the wrong thing, you know. He's but, like a therapist. It's just sex, sex, sex. Yeah. <laughs> I think about food. I always use lasagna. Maybe that's my testosterone level or something. I just sort of like describe like, you know, if you think about the food you most want and how your body has gastric juices and it's ready to eat, you know, even though it's imaginary food. Or if we remember a painful memory, if we have trauma memories, we even have the emotions and they're not even connected to the narrative memory, which is one of the weirdest things about trauma for people is like, it's, you know, people have full on flashbacks, that's dreadful. But more often when people have like relational trauma or childhood, like emotional trauma, the feelings come back and people don't, they don't, they're not sort of processed in the hippocampus the same way. So they just, people don't even know what's going on. So they're like with their friends and they feel as if they're going to be punished and they don't really know why. So the brain makes up all these stories, you know what I'm? referring to kind of so, so something triggers them something yeah. unconscious yeah yeah and then the emotion is there they call it emotional re-experiencing or body memories or emotional memories and they move into a shutdown mode or hypervigilance or irritability and in fact it has nothing to do with the present it has to do with the past just showing up you know it's kind of scary for a lot of it's one of the scarier things for a lot of my clients is uh, that kind of experience so what can they do when there's no connection when you don't even remember the memory Part of it is the mindfulness piece allows you to step back from your experience and recognize like the physical sensations in the body to slow down and ground in some sense of emotional safeness and a slow rhythm, and then to observe your thoughts as events rather than as reality and allow yourself to label your emotions and like distinguish the physical sensations from the action urge. So I might feel like a primitive way to describe uh, a feeling like maybe if you're a little kid would be like, I feel like I want to hit someone, you know? And then a little more sophisticated is, oh, I'm feeling anger. And then a little bit up the food chain with like years of practice and we like work on ourselves. 
we might be able to say, there's like a tension in my back and my fists are clenching and my jaw is tight and I feel like an urge to hurt or to protect. That's anger. You know, it's an anger. And then you can make these connections. But with that mindfulness practice step, right, the next step of practice is like making room and using the imagery we described to ground yourself in emotional safeness to stimulate the body's inner attachment system and like evoke and identify with a version of yourself that is strong, wise, and committed and that can, that can handle the situation. And then in time, with repeated practice of that on the meditation cushion or <laughs> kitchen chair, you know, you bring that into your life, right? So then in the middle of a frustrating exchange, you're triggered and you can slow down and go, wait, and become this version of myself that has like strength and wisdom and courage and can face the, the situation. I've heard that's a very gentle approach, isn't it? I've, I've actually heard some people who've said that after they've been doing this kind of technique, shall we say, for a while, then they can catch the memory. They, 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 it comes, it pops into their mind. Is that, have you experienced that as well? Oh, sure. Yeah. You can reconnect when you ground in the present. Like there's even some basic techniques like using your peripheral vision to, to recognize that you're here and now to rub your hands together, to feel your feet on the floor, things that are common to like DBT and work and like, you know, uh, safeness, embodying safeness, that kind of thing. Once you're grounded and you're here and now you can experience the trauma memory as what it is. And you can make connections. You can you can do what they call historical validation in, in dialectical behavior. So you'd say like, of course I'm being triggered in this situation of, you know, my friends want me to make a decision about what we should have for dinner. And of course that triggers me because this was exactly what would happen when I was a kid. My parents would start to fight and they'd scream, they'd lock me in a closet or something dreadful. You know, this isn't not autobiographical, but I have my own dreadful stuff, but it's not, it doesn't happen to be that, you know, so then you're like, ah, oh, okay, that's that memory. That's it. And then you can like befriend that part of you. You could do like multiple selves or like chair role plays, or you can just imagine that child part and give it what it needs. Maybe it needs to be protected. And there's all these nuanced ways we can work with this material once we slow down and get to know what's happening, you know? Because some people do a lot of hallucinogenics or, or or ayahuasca therapy and things like that to deal with trauma. Does that work for some people or is, have you found that the compassion therapy is, is universal? Or? I think the the research around psychedelic stuff is promising. There's an old Alan Watts saying that like, when you get the message, hang up the phone, you know, like, so like if people have experiences through psychedelics, even recreationally that open themselves to possibilities, then probably good to move past the drug experience into the practice experience. You know, I was talking to a client who's going to do some psychedelic therapy and she was curious about what to expect and how it would help her. And there's an old metaphor that like, you know, practice paths are like climbing, you know, kind of walking up a mountain, like, you know, like a, imagine a mountain and you're going around a spiral and you get to the top and like the psychedelic experience can be a little bit like like a trampoline that like you the giant trampoline, you like boof and you jump up and you see what the top of the mountain looks like. And you're like, Oh, I'm up here. This is really cool up here. And then you kind of, <laughs> then, you know, yeah. like that. Yeah. And then you can go, okay, now, now I'm going to do the work to like really generalize, you know, they call it like generalization training and behavioral kind of things like multiple exemplar training, generalization, that thing. Okay. So you're not ruling it out. You're just saying that you, there's work to be done. Oh yeah, no, I, I think when it's done responsibly and in a clinical setting, which is hard because of laws, like a, as there are more legal, well-researched psychedelic uh, assisted therapies, it can be a part of, it can be part of your recovery, sure, if it's done responsibly. And hypnosis, is that part of your therapy as well? Or? That's an interesting question. I've never had training in hypnosis formally, and yet a lot of it, you know, spent a lot of years doing the sort of uh, Gurdjieff methods of meditation and movement and things. And I know that there's an overlap with hypnosis there. And I know that Paul Gilbert in CFT, there's some elements that are related to hypnosis. And I've had <laughs> workshops where 
I was oddly almost like accused of it being mass hypnosis, like in a movie. <laughs> sort of like a famous psychologist who had a really positive experience doing compassion imagery at the end said, you just hypnotized everyone. You, you hypnotized us into feeling like, and I was like, what are you talking about? You know, like, so I don't really, I'm not expert in that area and I don't really know exactly what happens with hypnosis, but I would suspect that it's something similar to deeper states of like immersive meditation and stabilization and grounding. It seems that way. Mm. It's interesting you say about those workshops. I had uh, Dan Siegel on the show a while ago. <clears throat> Have you, is it, you know him well? Or? Oh, I don't know him personally really well. I've had like maybe one call with him, but I love his work and I cite him often. And he's, he's close with our, my friend, Paul Gilbert and, and our, actually our postdoc, uh, who I mentioned earlier, Atalia Vogel, she did some work with, uh, Dan for a number of years. Cause it's, uh, at the top of the mountain is every, all close together now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Cause he said something very interesting about, uh, rigidity and chaos. And how all the, all the conditions or uh, are either one of these two. Have you, have you, are you familiar with that? I'm not exactly that nomenclature, but what, one of the things we talk about in both acceptance and commitment therapy and CFT is like the, the difference between like flexible responding and inflexible responding and like broad behavioral repertoire possibilities and narrow, and then uh, possibilities and narrow attention and broad attention. Like, so when we're under threat, we're designed by evolution to just attend to the threat. We're having this lovely chat, but if all of a sudden I heard like a crash in the next room, all my attention would go there, there you go, right? And then all your behaviors are about that because that's survival. And when we're, when we're out of like the immediate like threat mode or the immediate like drive or addiction mode, we, we, we can be in a mode that has more expansive possibilities, that's more flexible attention, and more broad behavioral repertoires. So part of what I, I like to think of is, like even if you think about dealing with phobias or obsessions or worries or trauma, it's like being in the presence of something that normally makes you feel anger, anxiety, shame, threat-based emotions, right? And, and using our self and other directed compassion to feel safe and expansive and and ground ourselves in flexible, broadening possibilities and broadening attention, you know, flexible focused attention is one of the definitions of mindfulness, you know, so that that's part of it. Yeah, that's great because, you know, with all my guests, I'll, I listen, you know, go down deep on each of you and then, mm. and, and I take it away with me, you know, and then I wish I should, could do another podcast after that, just because to take things away. So, because I did look around at my friends and see, not that they're mentally ill, but of course we all are, you know, yeah, sure. but, but they were either, you know, rigid, rigid, kind of stagnant, you know, repeating the same behaviors or they were chaotic, like not repeating any, you know, too variable. And I guess what you're saying is that if you, if you're, if you, if you center in the moment and you come into the body and compassion, then it, it, it's, it's, it's the, it's the panacea, it's the solution to, to either you don't have to worry about what it is at that moment, you, if you just come into the present self. You know, yeah, that's, that's a really important way to put it. And again, I appreciate the way you understand context and like you, you research the people you work with. It's, it's important to note, but it's, it's modeling something for your listeners too. It's modeling like a way of being like to approach things with care and curiosity. I'm, I'm citing and mentioning a lot of the same people over and over again, but there's a wonderful quote from, from Robert Fripp that's, and I'm sure other people have said something similar, but that improvisation like is the experience of innocence in the presence of experience, you know? So it's like, let's say that again, it's that, that you could understand improvisation. And I think he was also mentioning like improvisation when it's, when it's, you know, flourishing, let's say that's the way I, I took it anyways, is, uh, innocence in the presence of experience, you know, so you can, you can understand all of the, you know, like scales and the chord changes and the calisthenic movements of your fingers on a guitar and your relationship to the audience. And you could have practiced things and phrases maybe thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And then in that moment, the relationship among the audience and the musician and the music itself, that triad. It's, it's a unique, beautiful expression of something new and fresh and innocent, you know? So it becomes 
in that, and, and I think the compassion work is like that. You know, you ground yourself in your therapy practice, in your maybe yoga or body practice, in ethical living, in compassionate imagery, in mindfulness, concentration, and service. And you ground yourself in the experience of emotional safeness to, to, to better deal with these really difficult emotions our tricky brain have. And then you might find yourself in a really challenging experience and you respond spontaneously to what's really happening to like the actual contingency, not to some rigid thing in your head. You're just like, respond, you know, that's sort of how it feels to me. So we don't do that most, most people, most of the time. You know, it's like, I think a lot of, I mean, hopefully we do some of the time, right? Naturally and it's nice to be able to do it with reliability and consistency as much as we can and to, to sort of like know what we're doing and to be choiceful. You know, like John Coltrane's Interstellar Space or like a Kadinsky painting or something like that can look really random or like even a Picasso, you know, or Brock. Like, but there's actually a lot of experience that went into that innocence and discovery. And uh, I think that's true of watching like like master therapists or like master, you know, some athletes and dancers or, or actors, you know, there's a spontaneity. So, but it's also, we know what we're doing and then we can just follow through in a, in a state of flow with more procedural, almost gestural movement rather than like deliberative rule governed movement. And, and, and that's what mastery I think can be is like that kind of responding personal mastery, mastery of ourselves. Yeah. Being within as well as what I got from my singing teachers, that if you're mm. great actors, uh, and the great musicians, they're within themselves. And once you go out, you lose it, you know? So I love the idea of singing teachers. You know, it's like, there's something so personal and physical about your voice being the instrument. And I know so many musicians who've studied so much and singers my friends who, you know, I'm, I, I sing a bit, but not so much anymore. And like my friends who like were primarily singers, when I've suggested singing lessons, often they like, not like you should get some lessons, but Hey, that's really great. And I took a couple lessons and it was helpful because of, you know, there's something that people really find it aversive. Like the, the way they wouldn't, if you said, oh, you should learn to play the cello. That, or, oh, wow. You're really good on bass. Have you thought about taking lessons? People are like, that's a great idea. But in the body, when I suggest it or, or discuss it with people, they were like, no, 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 I wouldn't take a lesson. This is my instrument, you know? But I think just like our hearts or our emotion or compassion or mindfulness, we can train our minds and bodies. And I'm really, I think, you know, I've heard you singing. It's quite, you know, again, we joked around about quite, it's very good. And I think it's, I'm glad to hear that you train your voice. You know, that's, that's very cool. They were very good teachers though. They teach you to be some no techniques. That's the more there. So it's kind of, yeah, as a whole other conversation. But I, cool. really, I really got really lucky to find them. And uh, wow. Yeah. They teach you to sing like a hundred years ago without the, you know, the forcing. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was really good. But I was also going back to what you said before about that innocence and in the presence of experience and also, you know, your daughter with the swing, and mm. it's like, and you said, you said yesterday about how we go from possibilities to no possibilities through life where we start. We, 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 yeah, we begin with the possible and we move to the, we move gradually to the impossible, you know, which I think is a hopeful idea in a way, the way I've always took it. Like, you know, you begin, you think, oh, I can't, that's not possible. And then you think, well, what is possible, you know? Like lately I've been studying, after 42 years of playing guitar, just the last six months, I've been immersed in uh, Django Reinhardt's music. And you, yeah, you hear it. And at first it's like completely impossible to play, you think. And then gradually with like a good teacher and, and good time and listening and a lot of practice, it kind of opens up, it reveals itself and and the impossible lets itself become possible. And I think that's true of like couples therapy, right? or like facing your fear of public speaking or healing from trauma. You know, like at first it's like, no, this is, I hear, so, 
so many times of people like who are really, really deeply depressed, they're like, I can't do it. I can't. They're like angry at me. Like, you know, we both know that I should be able to go to the pool and talk to my friends, but I can't do it. You know, serious. And it's sort of like, well, what if you could, you know, and like, what would you be if, and this is a, this is a kicker. It's a classic, you know, uh, therapy question. What would you be afraid of if it were possible? And then usually it's like, oh, well then I would go down there and maybe, maybe they wouldn't like me or they'd know that I was depressed or that I'd, I'd feel ashamed. Oh, okay. So even if we made it possible, you'd have to face that pot. Yeah. Well, are you willing to face that possibility? Like if facing that fear was a necessary part of going down to the pool, would you do it? Be like, yeah, now that you mention it, and it's something, you know, so we begin with the possible. And then we just kind of gradually, there's another Krishnadas uses this quote. I think it's from, I think it's from his teacher, Neem Karoli Baba, which is like, he's talking about chanting and repeating the names of God. And it's like with repetition of the name, which is sort of like to, to form a practice, like with repetition of the name, gradually, but inevitably, things become possible, like gradually, but inevitably. Isn't it a cool, it's like, it gives me chills remembering that. These are great lyrics. Just going to steal all of them. <laughs> That's awesome. Because it reminds me of Eckhart Tolle when he had that famous breakdown. He said he was basically his own therapist having, because, because we have the conscious mind and we have the super conscious mind. Mm. A lot of the affirmations I do are, you know, like I am divine spirits. I am now mastering my mind and my body just to, you know, get out of myself. I guess, since, and that works on some subconscious level as well, you know? The thing is, it's true, you know? And it's even m more true or truer than all of the things that are going to seem more important all day. Like, you are divine presence, you know, and you are the universe getting to know itself in its multiplicity. And... You are mastering your body and mind, which is to say you are the divine mastering a body and a mind, one of billion countless like emanations of its presence. And when you can abide in that awareness of your true nature and remember it, things become possible in miraculous ways. But the game, sort of the hide and seek that God plays with herself, you know, is like we then forget you know, we fall back into our dream. And I think I'm, I really got to take care of this organization of my sitting room, because if I don't, I, br 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 why didn't I invest differently? Or why was I such a fool when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, and 15s? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you're the, you are the divine presence. It's, uh, you know, this is like the divine having a nice little conversation with, with, with themselves today. So that's when the breakthrough comes is that you really there's an, uh, one technique um, that I've, I've used as well, the fishing line technique, where you just, you know, watch the watcher and you just can, you, well, if, you ca if you're catching a fish, you're, you can't just pull it straight in, can you? Because you'll break the line. Uh, so you have to let, give it line and let it run. And, you know, because the conscious mind has ruled us through countless, countless lives. And, you know, you can't just, if you try and force it, you can't control it. You can't do it directly. So you have to just let it tire itself out. And then eventually it'll just come swim into the net, you know, and say, okay, what, what do you want me to do now? Yeah. I love that. That's a real, I'm going to really sit with that. That's a beautiful metaphor. It's important. I haven't caught the fish yet, but it's hooked. That's, that's really, that's beautiful. That's, I mean, and I think what's really important is that you're creating the causes and conditions around you that facilitate awakening and that in some ways to me is, is huge it's hugely important you know you create the correct causes and conditions that allow allow the awakening mind to grow and emerge and other things to fall away with all the effort in the world i've found in my own life speaking for myself all the hard work and effort but the wrong conditions and causes, the wrong intentions and the wrong associates and the wrong setting and the wrong lifestyle, like, and the wrong inputs, that makes it really hard no matter how hard I'm working. But if you, the correct causes and conditions, it becomes very easy. 
it's kind of like, there's a lot to say in a weird way and nothing to say about that simultaneously. I get my techniques and all that from the, cause that's the reason also, well, I started the podcast is to do, it was for the Ethereum Society. Oh, wow. Is, uh, yeah. It's a British, um, originally he, um, master of yoga, an English mm -hmm. master of yoga started it and he practiced advanced yoga after the war in England, you know, the, the mantras and the pranayama and all and many of oh. things. So, I mean, that was, that was way back when, and he became a descended master and, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, raised Kundalini up to the ground chakra and, and he became the, so it's a kind of a, it's a UFO religion. So with kind of yogic base, because it says that when we, when we, cause we're incarnating through countless incarnations to as the divine experiencing itself, as you said, but then once we've raised Kundalini, once we've gone through ascension, con cosmic consciousness and enlightenment in that reverse order, then we don't have to stay in this classroom. We go on to other planets. Mm. That's, which kind of makes sense because if we're reincarnating, you know, there must be a beginning and an end in which, where do you go after you've ascended? I mean, well, I mean, time, you know, there's, there's, there's linear time. There's, you know, JG Bennett, another wonderful British, like the spiritual thinker and master and seven, like it describes like linear time and then infinite time or eternity. And then a concept called hyparxis, which is more like vertical time, like the simultaneity of all moments that out stuff. It's called Uji in, in, in Zen practice to being time, the quality of time that is outside of like what act folks were RFT would call diactic frames. It's not like constructed human perspective on time. So I would assume that like in, in that one moment in all moments, if there's infinite possibilities and like many, many worlds and many, many instantiations of physicality, like, you know, your consciousness would inhabit different planets, different, I mean, why would it not incarnate? Like what? That wouldn't make any sense. That would, that's just. It's not even so weird. Like if, 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 if we grew up before, you know, technology, you would dim, you would, you know, do you think over the hill, you would even, could we reincarnate it over the hill? Like, you know, if somebody said, oh, you would reincarnate in Spain or in Hong Kong, it wouldn't even, once you were into the idea of reincarnation, it wouldn't phase you at all to think that because we can travel there. But that would have seemed really weird if you didn't know what Spain was, if you were like in Kainichi and like, you know a thousand years ago. So like, right, you know, like I dig what you're talking about. I'll have to look up this uh, organization and see what they, what they do. It sounds really like you've gotten a lot out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense when you, you know, it's the electromagnetic spectrum that, you know, matter exists at different frequencies and life exists at different frequencies, like the astral realms, you know, when we, uh, we die, we go exactly here, just a different frequency of vibration. And, and it's the same, all the other planets are inhabited at different frequencies so and then we keep evolving so we you know because consciousness merges and we go into great into larger and larger beings and eventually we form planets and then planets form sun you know suns and then suns galaxies so this it's this evolutionary um pathway spiritual evolution so well, it's fascinating material yeah he channeled the book called the nine freedoms so yeah it's, it lays it all out there that's cool I'll take a look. Well, I probably, I meant to talk with someone in, in about two minutes. I probably, unfortunately, we should conclude. It's a lovely conversation. I really so appreciate you in, inviting me to chat with you about all this stuff. And, you know, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. We got there in the end, Dennis. I'll get to work on the song. Yeah, cool. And, you know, uh, hopefully there's something useful in, in our discussions in there. That's <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Definitely going to be inspired. That's great. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Thank Dennis. Bye. Compassion and living is easy to do. The scene is already there inside of you. Try. It's possible that your old habits
it's done It's possible to change the way you feel It's possible to become the ideal Maintain a loving heart In the presence of strife Awaken your courage Reclaim your life Observe anxiety Watch it get quashed With love as your compass You'll never get lost It's possible inspiration thanks dennis you can follow dennis on twitter dennis turch phd and if you want to hear the song again and again you can stream it on spotify itunes deezer all the usual places or download it for a dollar from podsongs.com which really helps to support the artists uh, my band is maurizio sanicola massimino vozza and luigi falcioni um, and all the money goes to them. I'm hardly making any money yet, so any contribution will be much appreciated. And also want to thank my researcher, Dori Verbo. And an honorary mention to the Ethereum Society, the teachings of which led me to start this project, serving the servers, helping those who help others. You can learn more about the society at ethereus.org. Until next time, have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.